welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and we've got another great show for you today. We'll be taking a look at new hardscape trends, reducing pesticide usage in and around your garden, and ideas for a home hydroponic growing system. But first, we're going to show you what can be done with a color near and dear to our hearts. Red is the color of our beloved Huskers, and there are a number of great ornamentals you can try to show that spirit around your home. So let's take a minute to talk about red. Since Valentine's Day is just behind us, I'm hoping you bought your Valentine something red or something edible or something a different color for Valentine's Day. But we are, of course, at Nebraska. Our color is Go Big Red, and this is the N150 year, 150 years of being big red in Nebraska. Red as a color in the landscape is a little hard to come by sometimes. Lots and lots of annuals available, like this incredible Pentus, which blooms all summer long. It's an annual. You can get lots of red in the foliage of some of the coleuses, and you can get what passes for red in some of the grasses. Now, one of the things about using red in the landscape, however, is that it will fight with green. You think about where red and green are on the color wheel, they're opposite. So what that really means is you need to figure out what is the saturation of the red in comparison to the green. Do you want it to pop against a dark green background? Do you want a mass that is all blooming at once, which really is probably going to have to happen only with annuals? Or do you want to be a little bit more subtle? Now clearly red with white, pure white, is not very subtle, but it certainly is something that's high contrast. You can also put red with purple, and the purple will tone it down a little. One thing for you to keep in mind about choosing your reds for your landscape is also are you looking at red that has some blue tones in it, or are you looking at red that is really a little bit hotter? It, it tends toward the oranges and the yellows. Because again, surprisingly, you can end up with what you thought was gonna be a great color combination of reds together. Instead, you're gonna end up with just enough of a subtle color clash that you're not gonna be happy with it. We do have a lot of perennials that are available that provide red in the landscape. Starting with our early American columbine, that native, we have some peonies that are red. You move through the growing season, we have a Monarda or Bee Balm, Jacob Klein, which is absolutely go big red and stands in those wet spots in a rain garden or in a low place in your yard and attracts those pollinators. Poppies, we think of the orange poppy as being really the one that's most available, but there is one called Scarlet O'Hara that is red with the most amazing black center. We also have some perennials that are a little bit uh, less common in the landscape that are, that are red and bloom a little bit later. And that would include ones that are Lobelia, which again is cardinal and it's maybe a little touchier. It likes a wet environment. We have, of course also have the monster big hibiscus and they're getting more and more red, deeper colors, bigger flowers, beautiful in the landscape and in your face when they are in flower. We have Gallardia. If you choose wisely, you can, you can choose Gallardias for sort of a short-term perennial in the landscape. I haven't even really talked about daylilies because of course we have many daylilies that are in the deep shades of red. And of course, then we have that old standby, shrub roses. Be careful with the shrub roses if you are going after red consistently because again, what you're going to look at is how much red against the green Make sure you choose wisely for shrub roses that really want to live in Nebraska and survive the winters. But there is really no good reason other than not thinking about go big red to not use red in your landscape. As you can see, there are plenty of choices for red, but it does take a little thinking about those backdrops and the combinations if you want that red to stand out as a focal point. Now is the time to get that planning done if you're going to enjoy those plants this upcoming growing season. We are working our way through some fundamental design tips for new homeowners on our Go Gardening series. We touched on hardscape placement last time we saw you. So today we're going to give you ideas for the pieces you can place around your landscape to make your outdoor living spaces beautiful and practical.
In a previous Go Gardening series, we talked about how to figure out where your hardscape elements and other features that are not green and growing should actually go in your landscape. So let's take a little bit of a look at some of the options that are available. You're now down to figuring out how do you actually choose what you want to install, sit on, look at, live with in your landscape. The options are tremendous. And of course, as with any industry, we have a lot of change over time, perhaps not as much as in the technology world, but every single year there are new pavers, there are new furnishings, new lighting choices for you to make. So how do you go about actually choosing those specific materials? Well, certainly cost is, is going to be an object and you, and you can always come up with a lower solution to a paver or to uh, a, a swing or a bench or lighting. However, what you also truly want to look at and think about is the experience you're trying to create. Do you want to have something that is a very low key, subtle sort of a hardscape plus furnishings plus lighting? Are you going with brighter colors? Are you going with a rougher texture? What exactly are you after? And there are a couple of good ways to go about thinking about that. First off, you collect catalogs. You go to the suppliers, you look not just at the catalogs or at what you can find on the internet, but you also actually explore those materials directly. To think about how you're going to walk on them or sit against them or sit on them. Think about how they will look in your own landscape with your home or with your business before you actually make the jump into specifically choosing a material. And this goes for everything from the boulders around your pond to the retaining wall materials you choose to the pavers or the, the patio surfaces, as I suggested, to the pergola if you want an up, uh, a structure that is overhead. We think in terms of being limited to uh, wood as an example, but you could certainly choose steel or you could use a material that is a composite material for anything from decking to the structure itself. We think in terms of low level landscape lighting that is kind of these funky little button looking things, and yet the lighting itself can be an incredible sculpture in your garden, depending on what you're after. It's a little bit like buying tennis shoes at this point. Used to be you could pick black, white, high top, low top. Now you, there are whole stores set up just for running shoes. It's the same thing in the hardscape or those other side amenity sorts of worlds. Lots of choices. Fire pits can be something that is a, a glass, glass block, glass bubble, lava rock sort of a fire pit that's low and long. It can be a fire pit table where you're using stone or slate or a concrete top on it to be able to make it something that is obviously going to be fire retardant, but it has a little bit of a different feel to it than sitting around the campfire when you were at camp when you were a kid. So again, exploring the options for materials, aesthetics, cost, ease of installation, especially if this is something that you really want to try to attempt yourself, being able to match it over time if you have a failure or if you want to change something or you don't want to match it. So you deliberately choose a, 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 a material that you can blend with something else as an option. And certainly the long-term management of that, of that material. You don't want to pick a brick as an example or a paver that is so slippery that when we get those little bitty pieces of ice or those tiny little ice storms, you're going to go scooting on your keister as opposed to being able to stand around your own fire pit. We've come a long way in our choices for hardscape when it used to be a few folding lawn chairs on concrete and a grill to fire pits, pergolas, and designed pavers. You can be as creative as you are with your landscape beds and your garden. Whatever you choose, the goal should be making your outdoor surroundings comfortable, beautiful, and practical. Shifting gears to our landscape lesson for this week, I've been promising to help you choose plants and now we can finally do it. However, we're not really going to get into specific plants, we're rather going to show you how to make good decisions when you purchase that plant material. When you're picking a perfect plant for the landscape, we always tend to look at the top first, and that's very important, but it's the roots that make the shoots. 
So let's take a peek here at what we've got, of course, in the dormant season. These have been sitting in the greenhouse. You can see this particular prairie smoke has a reasonably good root mass, but it's pretty root bound already. We're always looking for those good, nice new white root tips. This one has a great top. It's in need of repotting. The size of the plant makes a big difference, as does the size of the pot. These are both rosemaries, and you'll notice on the small one here, we have a root system that really is actually to the point where it needs to be repotted. So you could take this home. You would have to do a little bit of manipulation on this, do some pinching, of course, to make sure that that plant stays healthy. And if you look at the rosemary in the big pot, what you see is this one really probably just got repotted and has some nice root initiation starting. The height of that pot or the height of the soil against the plant is also very important. You don't want a lot of soil covering the root mass of the plants because that is essentially buried too deep. Look at this one, which is a vine that's a little hard to, to uh, trellis, but this is a pretty small pot. And this again is a root system that doesn't look terrible, but it's been in that container a long time. It's got good root initiation here though, and it's also got decent stems. So it is that combination of the roots to the shoots that you look at if you're really gonna pick a good plant for the landscape. Your landscape will be ever evolving, so when you're getting started, keep in mind that some plants might thrive, others might need some rethinking, and you might have to get rid of some of them altogether. And that's part of gardening, which is getting the right plant purchased, getting it in place, and helping it live. One of our primary goals of both Backyard Farmer and Lifestyle Gardening is to help you reduce your chemical pesticide usage. For this week's industry interview, we'll hear from Tim Krager from the Nebraska Department of Agriculture about integrated pest management. We get so many questions about what is this in my landscape and what can I do about it? And that is all about pest management. So I'm fortunate today to be talking to Tim Krager, who is Pesticide Program Manager with Department of Ag. And Tim is going to give us all of the skinny, if you will, on exactly how we do integrated pest management. All right, Tim, exactly what is IPM? Integrated pest management is what IPM stands for. And it is uh, the choices that a person makes so that they don't automatically go to the pesticide container for pest control. It, it involves three fundamental concepts, mechanical, biological, and cultural control of the pest. And so for mechanical or physical control, a person would choose to perhaps pick the cabbage loopers off of their vegetables or in, intentionally change the structure of a plant or a landscape. In the case of biological control, we're talking about um, using beneficial insects to control a pest that we don't like. And there's plenty of options out there for, for those kind of organisms. They're a biological organism that controls a pest. In the case of cultural control, now we're talking about landscape design, we're talking about plant pruning, and also about the, the, uh, the varieties of plants that we put in the landscape the types of turf grass species that we use that might be disease resistant or drought resistant. All those uh, ways of approaching a pest control problem help us avoid the use of pesticides. And then eventually, if nothing else works, our last choice would be pesticide. Are there environmental issues that really would impact their ability to use some sort of a chemical if they really need to go that far with it? And what should they do before they actually start spraying? Well, there's some excellent guides uh, and university has extension bulletins on IPM and how to incorporate those practices in your home garden. Um, the idea is that, you, uh, first of all, you need to understand the pest. You need to be able to identify the pest so that you really know what you're up against. Then you can decide whether the cultural, the biological or mechanical control would work. And if none of that works, then uh, pesticides may be an answer, but even then within integrated pest management, we ask people to look for the lowest toxicity pesticides first instead of going after the most toxic products thinking that they're going to cure the problem. 
So Tim, they, they have decided they really can't stand the threshold that they're looking at. They really do want to do something that is still an integrated pest management practice. What do they need to look at or know about the product itself? The, the homeowner should understand basic concepts about pesticides. Uh, they all have a label. The labels are approved by the Environmental Protection Agency and registered by our agency for use in the, in the state. There's a lot of different types of pesticides in the marketplace. A homeowner would go into their, their home garden store or perhaps a hardware store to find a pesticide to use for the problems that they think they've got. And they need to understand there's a degree of concentrations. Uh, the, the, the low impact pesticides I mentioned earlier are typically ready to use formulations. You would, a squirt bottle or a bag of fertilizer with pesticide in it is a good example. Uh, they would read the label. We always encourage people to read the label. And importantly, to wear protective gloving and, and perhaps eyewear and footwear when they apply those products. And then follow the instructions on how to use it. They don't need to further dilute it. It's ready to go right out of the container. But it's also important to know that uh, it may not be a multi-use product. It may be a one-time use and then wait to see how it, how it works. Uh, contrary to that, we also have concentrate pesticides. Those take further dilution or mixing with other products. Uh, it's a little more uh, uh, concerning for people to follow the label directions correctly, to dilute it correctly and use it correctly. People need to understand when we're dealing with a concentrate pesticide, the toxicity is increased. And so it's even more important to wear proper protective clothing when they do that. The pesticide labels inform the user on what those protective clothing should be. Tim, I really appreciate your coming in and talking to us today about this. And hopefully our audience will have learned a little bit about don't just kill it. Let's use best practices to manage it first. Well, thank you, Kim. And I've appreciated being here. Sometimes the only choice is to use chemical pesticides. We do want to touch our home landscape very gently, so keep in mind that there are other methods and techniques that you should choose first before you reach for that spray bottle. And as always, responsible gardeners read and follow those label instructions. It's time now to answer a few of your questions. If you've got a question you'd like to submit to the show, drop us an email at byf at unl.edu. As always, tell us as much information as you can, including where you live. Attach those pictures as JPEGs. Very clear JPEGs, please. Our first question comes to us from Broken Bow. This is a viewer who has a very old tree. She loves this tree. She knows it's not in the best of condition. Uh, it does provide shade for her home and for the landscape, but she is worried about uh, what appears to be quite, quite a large area of damage high in the crown of the tree. And if you look closely at this picture, what you will see is poor structure to begin with. It appears as though maybe this tree was not pruned when it was young. So multiple main branches coming from one point. We have a little bit of what we call included bark, and that is the bark that turns in like this as opposed to pushing out like that, which means that connection between the branch and the trunk is weak and getting weaker and weaker as everything grows together. And then there's a big hole in the top. Anytime we see a big hole like that, especially when it looks like there has not been any compartmentalization around that hole, that's a perfect spot for additional rot to occur. Moisture gets in, who knows, she might even have a family of resident raccoons that have decided to live in, in that particular spot in the tree. What I would recommend on this tree, especially thinking that it is likely pretty close to the house based on the description, have a certified arborist come out, take a look at the tree, see whether in fact it is a hazard to the extent that our next big snow event or a windstorm or sometimes sudden limb drop happens could drop that tree on the house and really cause a lot of damage. And we all know how difficult it is to lose one of those big beautiful trees that has provided so much enjoyment and comfort over, uh, over the lifetime of uh, a particular property. Our second question, we don't know where the viewer is from, but it could pretty much be anywhere based on this one. She is frustrated over what she says is her dogs in the backyard are digging in these strange places and they go to the same place and they keep doing the same thing and snuffling their noses around and looking for something or, or going after something. Which, first off, 
that's dogs, they do that kind of thing. But what we can't really see there is we don't see any vole trails. We had a question about voles earlier on an earlier show. We're seeing lots of vole trails, but you would see those trails as, the, as that sort of cupped upward little runs from wherever they've sheltered and, and coming out under the snow. In this instance, um, it could be that they are actually after the droppings of a critter. You know, something smells really good and it's under there. It could be that they have had enough snow in this particular location that the vole trails are under the snow that we can see in the picture. The long and the short of it is short of, short of actually fencing the dogs out of that area. There's not a whole lot that I think we could suggest that would really be effective for the long run. I know that, you know, my dog will go out and he'll find something particularly delicious in his mind that I can't even see and then he'll, of course, either try to dig it or he'll roll in it, which can be pretty devastating when he comes into the house. So not great pieces of, of perfect advice, but that's pretty much what it looks like to us. We have another question this week that actually could have come apparently from multiple viewers in different parts of the state as we had, again, those strange swings in temperatures, up, down, up again. Thank heavens for all of us who are getting a little bit tired of winter. But this is a what is this critter that they found on their stoop. And it's so fun and so sad at the same time because what that critter is, is the caterpillar of black swallowtail butterfly. And it is one of the ones, I know our entomologists love it and we love to get pictures of it and talk about it because what looks like that monster head and those monster eyes, those are fake. And what that is intended to do, of course, is great big head, great big eyes, great big critter, which might in fact be damaging or dangerous to whoever, whatever other critter is trying to eat it. So he's probably no longer with us because this was found on one of those, uh, a warm weekend on a, on a nice warm piece of, of concrete. And the chances of finding his way into a place where he could shelter from the cold and the ice storm is probably slim and none. But the beauty of that guy is there are lots of those around typically. We had wonderful, wonderful black swallowtails last year in our backyard farmer garden and all over lots of parts of the state. So, you know, if you see these, these insects, some of which are pests, some of which are not, just be thankful you get to see them and, and cross your fingers and hope they get to live through whatever storm is gonna hit us next. Let's wrap up today's program with something fun that you can actually try at home. Gardening doesn't just have to be in the spring and summer months in Nebraska, and if you've got a little mechanical ability, you can try a hydroponic system in your own basement. Here to tell us more is UNL Assistant Ag and Horticulture Professor Sam Wartman. So what we have here is a hydroponic lettuce production system. There are many different types of hydroponic growing systems. This is what we call a, a gutter system or a nutrient film technique NFT system. And this is great for growing leafy greens like lettuce, like you see here. This is kind of a, a loose leaf green lettuce that uh, does really well in this shallow channel type of system. You can see um, that we've got roots that are freely suspended in a water and nutrient solution. So that's kind of the definition of a hydroponic system is one that is without soil and depends on just water and nutrient solution for the media. Now we are cheating a little bit because we've got this little grow plug here. This is what we call uh, a rock wool plug. So this is actually heat expanded um, basalt rock and it's kind of like stone wool that you would use to clean at your home but instead this is a, a propagation media. So we can start lettuce from seed in here and then we can put it directly in this system and as that seed germinates and grows, eventually the roots start to grow through this rock wool cube and they just kind of hang out and, and dangle down into that uh, nutrient film solution and eventually you'll get lettuce big enough that you can harvest and, and eat uh, for your own. And uh, what's cool about these hydroponic systems is that uh, it allows you to grow year-round. So you might be 
getting the itch uh, to garden this time of year when we've got snow and ice coming down outside right now. And you can build one of these systems fairly inexpensively on your own in, um, in your home. And some things that you'll want to think about as you go to, to build these. Uh, one is that you'll need supplemental light. So to grow things like lettuce, we're here in a greenhouse where we get plenty of, of good intense sunlight through our glass panels. Even in the winter, we're getting 10, 11 hours of sunlight. But if you're going to do this in your basement, for example, you'll want grow lights that could be LED lights. Um, those could be fluorescent fixtures. But you'll want a light source over this entire system. You're going to need a water and fertilizer solution and a pump. So down here, you can see it's humming along. We've got uh, water and a submersible pump. It's pumping water up into one end, and then it feeds via gravity down to the other end and then it returns back into the reservoir and pumps all the way back. And what's good about these nutrient film technique systems is that only a very small portion of the roots is in the water and nutrient solution, which keeps the oxygen levels high enough in that root zone so that we don't get any problems with plant growth. So typically, if we're in a field, if you're in your garden, too much water in that root zone is a bad thing. We get waterlogged soils and we usually get dead plants. But uh, in a hydroponic system, if we can get oxygen into that root zone, like in the nutrient film technique system, the plants are happy and healthy. And so this is a great way, fairly low cost, it's fun, it's a different way to grow plants and allows you to have some fresh produce all year round. It's fun to see what a little creative engineering can do for those of us who want fresh produce of our own all year long. Maybe you've got a space in your basement or your garage that you can experiment with a hydroponic system of your very own. Well, we've got one more show for you, and next time on Lifestyle Gardening, we're going to hear about chemical drift, laying out your plants before they go in the ground, and promoting pollinators. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good morning, good gardening, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.